All right. Woo-hoo. Amen. Love it. Well, God bless you guys. So good to see you guys. We're going to get right into the Word of God uh, as we always do. Um, I do want to say this. If you were not here last week, we did make an announcement that our beloved pastor and his wife, they have decided to go on a sabbatical for, for the next three months. So we're excited about that. I spoke with Al yesterday. Uh, he's trying to get some R&R. It's really hard for him to unwind because he has all these you know, speaking engagements and different things. But, uh, you know, just, just keep him in prayer. He's healing from his eye because, you know, he did have an eye surgery. And so, so it's a good time for them to be away. And so uh, he's entrusted myself and the leadership here to just continue on. We're going to have myself and Pastor Nathan and other guest speakers coming in. We're just going to keep teaching the word. That's what we do. Amen? Amen. Today we have the wonderful topic of Father's Day. So open your Bible. He didn't tell you where to go because it's a topical message. So we're going to be all over the place, okay? So I'm just going to go ahead and jump right in to what, the God, what, what God has put upon my heart. So uh, strap in. Here we go. Let me just say this. Women, it's not just for fathers, this message, okay? So, <laughs> so but we get a day, so let us have it. Amen. So, <laughs> Father's Day. Uh, so in studying uh, for, this, for this particular sermon, uh, I did a little research on Father's Day. I never have before. And um, did you know that Father's Day was uh, first celebrated uh, on June 19th, 1910? Um, which is kind of recent if you think, if you think about it. Because dads have been around forever, right? And we're barely getting a day. Actually, that wasn't even the, the official national holiday. That did not come into play until 1972 when Richard Nixon signed that in. So he did something good there. So hallelujah. <laughs> good old Nixon, yeah. The day was originally designated as a time to celebrate fathers for all that they do. That's a wonderful thing. We should take that time to celebrate it. And today, we're going to do that in different ways, eating steak or lounging or whatever it may be, hanging out with your family, hopefully. Amen. It should be celebrated. But you know, we live in a society, unfortunately, which allows fathers to be mocked and ridiculed through the media, uh, mainstream media, and, and advertising. It's crazy. I was, I was researching, and I found this website called The Daily Caller, and there was this article that I thought was intriguing. It was back in uh, April of 2018, a woman named Terry Brennan, actually who's an advocate for fatherhood, um, she wrote this article, and it's called American Popular Culture Portrays Fathers as Idiots. That's, that's pretty awesome. Okay, great. Let me read what she said. Just a couple things here. She says, while dads in Leave it to Beaver and the Donna Reed show had flaws, they were close to what was then thought of as perfect, part of an idealized white American family in that time. Later, shows such as The Cosby Show, Family Ties, Growing Pains, and Full House showcased Caring dads of a new generation. Amen. You guys remember those shows? Those are great shows. But polar opposites replace these characters with married with children, Al Bundy, with Homer Simpson from The Simpsons. Do! You know, I mean, they're a new genre of dads. And so we saw that in the media, and it's still happening even today, everywhere we see. Even in advertising, look at this quote, I have it up on the screen. She said this, ad after ad makes doltish dad the butt of all jokes. He's outwitted by his children. He's the target of condescending eye rolls from his wife. He's a dumb, incompetent, sometimes even selfish oaf. But his family loves him anyways. Wow. As I read that, I was just in agreement. That that's that's kind of what society you know, portrays. That's the imagery that comes across. That's what they want you to think about a value of a dad. That they're just there because, well, at least they have a pocketbook. Sad. Interestingly enough, that that reflects the imagery of our father that's in heaven. And that's what Satan would want to promote, right? But not so. I'm going to just say this for the record. My dad was not like that. I had the wonderful privilege of a godly man who led me to Christ. And he's in heaven now, and I get to see him one day. But thanks, Dad. 
I just want to say thanks, Dad. Hallelujah. <clears throat> I don't want to get emotional. <clears throat> so if society is doing that, how should we believers respond to the mindset towards Father? I'll tell you how to respond. We respond with the Word of God. Hallelujah. In Ephesians chapter 6, verses 2 and 3, you might, you might know this famous uh, verse. It says this. It's from the Old Testament. Um, Honor your fathers and mother, which is the first and great commandment, that it may be well with you and that you may uh, live long wherever you go on earth. How important that is, that we would walk with the Lord and honor if we are children. Honor our earthly parents. That's what it says. So honor fathers and mothers. But you know what? This is our day. So, <laughs> But the team together, parents are so vital. Why? Because God ordained it. That's what he had for all society. How important that is. Father's Day then is a great opportunity to appreciate the love and the effort of fathers everywhere. Today we will examine the attributes of of a good father. That's my title. The attributes of a good father. We're going to look at it from two perspectives. In those two perspectives, we're going to recognize and honor our heavenly father. And then secondly, we're going to recognize and honor our earthly fathers. Are you guys with me? Yes, sir. All right. Here we go. Our heavenly father. Of all the ways the Lord God Almighty could have chosen to relate to humanity, he chose the term father. Pater is the Greek word, pater. And so it, we see in scriptures, if you do your homework, God the Father is mentioned 265 times in scripture. Yeah, 200. Think he wants to communicate something? Most of those are found in the New Testament because through Jesus Christ, our big brother, <laughs> we have a new identity. We've been adopted as children of God. Ephesians 8.15 talks about that. So when I think about this, I'm like, wow, you mean the God of the universe wants to claim us as his own? And I'll say, yeah, yeah, he does. He delights in that. He delights to call you his children. I have proof, biblically. 2 Corinthians 6.18 says this, I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. He delights to call you his children. Now, I don't know what your experiences are with your earthly father, but you have a heavenly father, the one that really super duper counts, and he says, I delight to be your father, and I want to take care of you. We'll look at that as we go on. How beautiful that is just to know that. And so, moving on regarding our Heavenly Father, I'm going to look at three little things within that topic, subtopics. Let's look at his paternal care. How does he care for people? Um, now, before I say that, I want to say, uh, I understand that the word Father uh, activates different memories in all of us based on your experiences with your earthly fathers. For some, Father is associated with heartfelt laughter. <laughs> My dad, he's crazy. Took me fishing, whatever it was. He was awesome. He provided for me. He loved me. And then for others, absenteeism, rejection, disappointment even. And if that's the case, I'm sorry. But you know what? Your heavenly father reaches down and says, you know what? I'm still here. My wife uh, did not grow up with her father. He left at three years old. Uh, when, well, she was three years old. And she had never known. And so when I met my wife, and, you know, it was an interesting first year of marriage. <laughs> it was great. Um, it was difficult. But you know what? She learned to depend on God the Father. And here we are 28 years later. Amen. God is so good. Yeah. God is good. Because God gave me a wife that believes in the Father. So, amen. And so, because of these different views, this is why it's important to understand God as not only our heavenly father, but also the fact that he is a good father. He's a good, good father. He knows how to give good things to his children, right? If a son asks for a piece of bread, will he give him a stone? No. You know, he, that's not him. God's not like he's dangling a carrot in front of you and goes, ah, psych. 
That's not the heart of God. He wants to give good things to his children because he's a good father. And so keep that in mind. Even, even though we might have had earthly fathers that have shortcomings, we know that our heavenly father is superior. In, in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 5 through 8, it mentions that our earthly fathers corrected us as they knew best. But our heavenly fathers, he corrects us because he does it for our own righteousness and holiness. He does it for our spiritual well-being. And that's awesome to know that discipline is good. It can be good when a father disciplines. Now, as I go on talking about this paternal care, I want to mention this biblical fact. I think it's worth noting. Because we live in a day in which uh, they're saying, well, how do you know that God is a he? Right? Well, all throughout Scripture, grammatically speaking, if you study the Bible, you'll see that God reveals himself to mankind in a masculine form. And you're like, well, show me. Well, okay, let's, let's have a Bible study. Uh, I'll show you if you look at the grammar. Okay? Now, that communicates strength, protection, and provision. And that's what we need a heavenly father for. Amen. As an earthly father. But I do want to say this also. His attributes are also revealed through his characteristics in Scripture, in which it indicates both father and mother, the way a mother would care for a son or daughter. He still has that same attributes. So you're like, well, wait a minute. Is he a man or is he a woman? He's neither. He's communicated in a masculine form, but you know what? God is spirit. Amen? He's spirit. He does not have flesh and blood like you and I. However, when Jesus manifested on this earth, he manifested in a, in a man's body, right? So it's just good to understand that scripturally speaking. But we see these expressions of a, of a man and a woman in scripture that communicates the fullness of God and his paternal care for you. His paternal care is expressed in scripture as caring and a compassionate God. Isaiah chapter 49, verses 15. I love this verse. Check this out. It says, can a woman forget her nursing child and not have compassion on the son of her womb? Surely they may forget, God says, but then he goes on to say this, yet I will not forget you. I will not forget you. See, I have inscribed you on the palms of my hands. Your walls are continually before me. Wow. You know what I see in that verse is that God is pledging his commitment to you. I will not forsake you. I will be there for you. Why? Because you're my kid and I love you. In fact, there are times that we go through life, we're like, man, I, I, don't, I, I need this. I don't have money. I need help. I need, you know, uh, love. I, it's not there. Well, you know what? You could go to your heavenly father. He will give it to you. But a lot of us, you know, we kind of see the concept of God the father. We're like, oh, well, you know, um, okay, yeah but I'm going to live it my way. And we're almost like spoiled little brats, you know? <laughs> you know, we only come to God when we need things. We don't come to him just to say, Papa, I love you. You're awesome. And when we have that relationship with the father of the universe, it changes your whole life. We'll talk more about that. Let me go on. And so he pledges that commitment to us. We see also regarding his paternal care that it's expressed in his heart for the fatherless. What? Yeah, even over there at Creekside. It's expressed in so many ways for those who are without dads. Look at this verse. It, it says in Psalm 68, 5. A father of the fatherless, a defender of widows, is God in his holy habitation. Up in heaven. But when it comes to those who are without dads, he knows the importance of it. Those who are outcast. Or maybe their dads passed when they were early. I don't know. He says, you know what? Here I am. I'm going to fill that void. I'm your dad. But do we acknowledge him as our heavenly father? That might be hard because we don't see him. We're like, you know, come on. I mean, my dad will, you know, give me some money. That's probably what they want. So, you know, um, but God, he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He can provide anything that you need. So he's a father to the fatherless. So you don't have a dad. He will give the nurturing care that a father on earth can give, but even more so. He's also a defender of widows. I love that. Women that are without husbands, he says, here I am, I'm going to fill that void. For some of you ladies, you're like saying amen to that. That's important. 
Because God knows exactly where you're at. He understands the importance of a man leading a household. And if there's not one in your household, he wants to be that. Because he's a, he's a father who cares. He's a dad. Awesome. Let me move on. Even King David understood and depended on this attribute of the heavenly father. In Psalm 27 verse 10, it says this. When my father and my mother forsake me, the Lord will take care of me. Beautiful. Beautiful. We can follow this theme of God and fatherhood throughout countless scriptures. Matthew 5, 45, 6, 9, and 32. Romans chapter 1, verse 7, and chapter 15, verse 6. 1 Corinthians 8, 6. And there's many others. Why do I share these verses with you? Because I want you to know that it's in scripture. And that I've done my homework. That God the Father exists. Amen. So... He absolutely adores you. I want to say this. Regardless of your experiences with your own personal father, I want you to know that you can cast your cares upon God. Why? Because he cares for you. Cast your cares. Whatever you're going through, you can cast it before the Lord right now. Yeah, but I can't pay the rent. Well, you know what? Cast it before the Lord. Don't go to anybody else. Go to the Lord first and say, Lord, you answer through this or through that, however you want to do it. But I'm going to my father first. I, I remember a time when my oldest daughter, Siani, she was driving her little car and she has low profile tires and everything and she was making a turn and she kind of like turned too quickly or something and she ran over the curb, you know, and she punctured the tire, push, you know, and the rim. And so she calls dad, dad, I'm like, hold on, hold on, I'll be there. Boom. It's right down the street. I go there. Uh, first I say, how you doing? I'm sorry, dad, I messed up the tire. I know it's expensive. Don't worry about the tire. How you doing? That's what our Heavenly Father does to us. How are you doing? And then I actually took the tire. I paid for it. It was very expensive. <laughs> our kids did this for that. And the rim. Got it back on. Got it going. Amen. Amen. But, you know, and the funny thing is, you know what? She has a job. She's an adult kid. <laughs> and she could have paid herself. But you know what? I need to be her dad. I wanted to make sure that she knew that I was there for her. Right? And, and that's what our Father, he's always there. In the difficult things in my life and situations, what God has done, I'm like, oh, my Lord, you're amazing. He shows up every time because he's a faithful, caring father. Can I get an amen to that? Amen. God is good. <laughs> and so he cares for us. Let me talk also about him being our heavenly father and his presence among us. Scripture tells us that he is not an absentee God. Do you know that? He's not absent. He's there. God told Moses, Joshua, David, and Solomon not to fear in their situations. In fact, uh, as he told them that, he said, I am the Lord your God, the one who goes with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. There it is again. And the same applies to us. God is a refuge and a strength, a very present help in time of need or trouble. He will be there for you. I pray that you're comforted in that thought. And so, all you have to do is call upon him for anything. Why will he do it? I've already said it. Because you're his kid. And he loves you. And it's that simple. Even if you're in a state of rebellion or rejection, you know what? If you truly call upon your heavenly father and say, man, I really need your help. Would you help me just this one? He's there. Is that scriptural? Yeah. Uh, what about, uh, what is that, Luke 15, prodigal son. Uh-huh. Yeah, it's all in scripture. God reflects. He shows us his care and concern for us. Without any condition, he's still going to love you. That's not why he loves us. He doesn't love us because you did this and you did that and you always make him happy. No, he loves you because he's God. And he's the initiator of love. How awesome that is. Let me go on to the third and final point regarding our Heavenly Father. He has a purpose for us then. So he has paternal care. He's always with us. But he has a purpose for us as his kids. The Bible makes that abundantly clear. That he created us for his glory. Yeah, for his glory. Isaiah 43, 7 talks about that. The ultimate purpose of man then is therefore to simply glorify God. In all that we say and do. 
Look at what it says in 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Therefore, whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Say that with me. Do all to the glory of God. You want to say that at Creekside? That's awesome. I like to include our brothers and sisters over there, man. Because it's their heavenly father also. In order to glorify God, you must have a real relationship first, right? That's important. How can you bring him glory if you don't even know who he is? When they asked Jesus this question, Jesus made clear what the greatest commandment was. Do you know the scripture? Matthew 22, verses 37 through 40. He said, here's the answer. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. That's it. You need to give everything to the Lord. That creates a right relationship with him. And then when you walk with him day by day, you start understanding the heart of your father, and he leads you and guides you, and you become this man or woman of God. And that gives him glory. When you know that this is your chief purpose in life to glorify God, your life radically changes. It's not about you anymore. It's about him. Just like a, a little kid will say, yeah, well, my dad could beat up your dad, you know. Yeah, well, my dad, you know, and they're boasting in their dad because he's the greatest man he knows. That's how we should be as, as children of God. Is he the greatest that we know? Yes. Praise him now. Give him glory because he's a wonderful God. He's a good God. He's a good father. 1 John four nineteen says that we should respond in love. We love him because he first loved us. Do you love or do you consider God as your heavenly father? Do you love him with all your heart on this Father's Day? Then glorify him today the way you live your life. Let me close this out. These are just a few points of the attributes of our heavenly father. There are so many attributes of God, but I'm trying to stay in context with, with Father's Day. As our Father, He wants us to know, to believe, to receive the extraordinary and unconditional love that He has for us. 1 John 3 1 says, Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we shall be called the children of God? Does that make you scratch your head? It does me because you know what? I know my wicked heart. I know that I'm a brat kid. I know that I'm selfish and I only think about myself. But that doesn't change his love towards me. Man, maybe there's some of us that need to hear that as a word today. You've been that. You've been pouting and touting and running around like, eh. And you know that about yourself and you don't like it, but you keep doing it. Maybe it's time to come before the Lord and repent. Say, Father, I'm sorry on this Father's Day. Even though you're in heaven, I want to acknowledge that right now. Will you forgive me, Father? He's all over that. He's the prodigal son bringing the, you know, the robe and killing the fatted calf. I want to bless you. You're my kid. How awesome that is. So beautiful. So it's a privileged perspective to have God as our Father. But there are people in this world that do not believe in God the Father. You know what I could say simply? If I could use a modern vernacular term, I would say... They have daddy issues. <laughs> they really do. And it shows in their life all the way through. If their dads, the way they treat their kids and family and wife or girlfriend or whatever it is, it's daddy issues. Because their pride, they will not humble themselves and submit to the fact that there is a God who created everything. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Proverbs 1.7. That's where it all starts. When I first read that verse, I was like, yes, that's an answer to life. Because I'm a fool and I played myself. I want to be a man of God. Well, so the first thing is you, you start fearing the Lord and how important that is. So let's go on into the next point because I'm going to talk about fearing the Lord in a moment. Let's talk about our earthly fathers. As I mentioned in Ephesians chapter 6 verse 2, we're to honor our fathers, right? And you'll be rewarded in your life. Amen. Why else should we honor our fathers on earth, maybe because God gave them to us, regardless of their stance. Earthly fathers, a.k.a. dads, papa, whatever you call your dad, 
2D. No, that wouldn't be good. Well, but some dads are 2D. You guys will get that. Anyways, whatever. <laughs> Earthly fathers are to be valued and respected. Let me ask you this. When was the last time that you showed honor to your earthly father, that you value him and his role, even though he might not be perfect. My dad was by, by no means perfect, but he did the best he could. And I am forever indebted to him. And I can't wait to see him again because I know he's with the Lord. I had the privilege, honor of closing my dad's eyes when he flatlined. It was just me and him. And I knew where he was at. And though my flesh was hard, I mean, hurting, I was able to say, yes, I have this hope that my father hoped, and I'm going to see you again, Pop. And one day when I pass this world, I'm going to cross through time. God's outside of time, you know. It's like my dad just passed away yesterday, even though it was 15 years ago. But when I die, it's like I go, whew, in the glory. Hey, Dad. That fast. It's not 15, 80 years, 40 years, whatever it is. No, you're there in the presence of God. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And we shall all be in the presence of our King and glorify his name together. Ten thousands of thousands of the saints and the angels worshiping and crying out saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. If you have that view of your heavenly Father, it will change you. It turns into doxology. It turns into praise. And you can always tell a person that's happy when they're walking around whistling. You know, praise the Lord. People are like, what's up with that guy? You know? Just hanging out with my pop. <laughs> so cool. Earthly fathers are, are definitely needed. Look at what Billy Graham says. He says, a good father is one of the most unsung, unpraised, unnoticed, and yet one of the most valuable assets in our society. Wow. Turn to Proverbs chapter 6. Let's look uh, at an actual verse. I know I've just been throwing them on the screen. But let's look at this one together. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 20. This is King Solomon speaking to his son. Now, if you don't know anything about King Solomon, he's considered the wisest man ever. And he's now speaking to his son. And so let's listen to his counsel. He says in chapter 6, verse 20, My son, keep your father's command. Value, in other words. Do not forsake the law of your mother. Bind them continually around your heart. Tie them around your neck. When you roam, they will lead you. When you sleep, they will keep you. When you awake, they will speak with you. For the commandment is a lamp and the law a light. Reproofs of instruction are the way of life. Great counsel he gives. He says, it's wise to listen to your father and mother's instruction. When we do that, he says, it's like tying a rope around your neck. Let's not look at it that way. Let's look at it as a nice necklace that a father gives to his kid. He like puts it on his neck. Son, here you go. It's like a badge of honor. And around that beautiful necklace is a wonderful jewel. And in that jewel contains all the wonderful teachings that mom and dad have given you. And where should it be? Right over your heart. Well, let's, let's, hopefully we can just push it in. In your heart. Not just in your mind. In your heart. How wonderful that is. He's saying tie it around your neck. And keep it there because it's going to guide you. It's going to lead you. It's going to direct you. That's what he gave us there. All of those things. Now, some kids would say, yeah, well, my dad, he's strict. And all he gives me is the law and the rule. And, you know, I don't want to hear it anymore. It wasn't even a necklace that gave me. He gave me a noose. And it was like, ah, you know. And you feel that way. Even if your dad gives you bad counsel, it doesn't mean you have to listen to it. You need to go to your heavenly father to ask for the right counsel. Amen? How about if you start reading the Bible yourself and fearing the Lord? That's important. So definitely valuable instructions for every child. And when we listen to that as a kid, we grow up and we learn to have good godly attributes ourselves. But I'm going to do this now. Uh, turn to Psalm 128. Turn to Psalm 128. Talking about good attributes, I was thinking, man, there's no real one passage that, that singly is exhaustive and lists all the ideal fatherly traits in Scripture. So as I was studying, and I saw that there were so many Scriptures about being a father, I thought I would use the acronym FATHERS. F-A-T-H-E-R-S. 
and use that as a guideline to talk about earthly fathers. So let's go through that really quickly, okay? First off, good fathers should fear the Lord. What should they do? Love it. I love it. Psalm 128, verses 1 through 4. Check this out. Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. When you eat the labor of your hands because you're a hard worker, you shall be happy. You're going to sleep good too. And it shall be well with you because you're walking in righteousness. Look at this. Your household, verse 3, your wife shall be like a fruitful vine in the very heart of your house. Your children like olive plants all around your table. Behold, thus shall be, uh, thus the man uh, shall be blessed who fears the Lord. So do you get the imagery there? I mean, I've, I've had the wonderful privilege of experience, experiencing this for the last 28 years of my life. That I sit at my table and I look over at my beautiful, fruitful wife. Actually, she's over there. And, and she exudes just this beautiful aroma of Christ. <clears throat> and I look at my kids. I have all these images of them. Just, you know, little olive plants. Bloop, 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 bloop. <laughs> Growing. And that is such an honorable thing as a man to have. How about this? Even if you didn't have that, the very fact that you have food on your table. Where does that come from? The very fact that you have a table. Because people who don't fear the Lord are scrounging for their next meal so many times. But from the very day that I got saved, I have never lacked one good thing. Because my father's awesome. He's a good God. <clears throat> Excuse me. He's a good father. So we too should fear the Lord. Thus shall the man be blessed who fears the Lord. Now here's the crazy thing. Your children, the little olive plants, they grow up. <laughs> yeah, that happens. All my kids have grown up. You know, I was looking at that video with all our pastors and they had their little kids. I was like, I would have to have my kids holding me because, <laughs> you know, emptiness, you know. Anyways, I, I, I was thinking back, excuse me, I was thinking back um, about my kids when they were small and, you know, your children will imitate your faith if you're fearing God, right? And I remember early on, my, my daughter Siani, me and Mary, we were driving our little white uh, uh, Nissan Sentra, and I used to like crank worship music. Woo! I'd be worshiping all the time, because I love Jesus, man, I love to sing. And yet, one time I'm driving, I'm worshiping, and the songs are on, and then my wife goes, look at your daughter, Siani, my, my firstborn, she was in her car seat in the back, and I look back, and she's like... <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh, that's awesome. My daughter's praising God at an early age, hallelujah. Uh, I thought about Jeremiah, my son. You guys know Jeremiah, he was on staff here for a while. He was here first service. Um, the cool thing about Jeremiah is like, he, you know, we homeschooled early on, and uh, he, had to, he had to draw a picture of what he wanted to be for his career. And he drew a pulpit, and him like this. I was like, dang, that's so cool. And then my youngest daughter, Gianna, how awesome. I remember one night we're going to sleep and I hear this little, Ooh. I was like, what's that? And I go over to her room and she's singing. She's singing a song. She's not singing Guns and Roses, Welcome to the Jungle. No, she's not singing that. You know what she was singing? Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy. And I was like, oh my gosh. That my children would fear the Lord. Where do they get that from? From their mom and dad. How are you guys doing in that area? How are you doing? Now maybe you don't have kids. That's okay. Still be a godly man. Still be a godly woman. Amen? How important that is. For time's sake, I got to move on because I'm a little bit behind. So that was F. Let's go on to A. Come on now. A. A. Good fathers are accountable to God for family. Psalm 127, verse 3 to 5. Look at what this verse says. It says, Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. And then it says this. Happy is the man who has his quiver full of them. Amen? 
You know what that means, a quiver? It's an archery uh, item to where when you have a bow and arrow, you know, you would have like either on your side, you would put your arrows in, or on your back if you're really cool. And what you're supposed to do then is a man who has many children, because those are what the arrows are, in their quiver, you take the arrow, you put it on your bow, and you say, God, help me to aim right. Because I want to shoot them into righteousness. Kapoo! And you let them go. You got 20 years maybe from their kid's birth to 20 years old. If you invested in those kids and you're aiming well, boom, you're going to do good. But you know what? If you're like kind of like, oh, dropping the arrow, mess up, whatever, I'm not even shooting my arrow, your kids are going to wander. Maybe you got a broken arrow. I don't know. But you know what? We are to be blessed if we're doing it right and we're shooting our kids in the straight path. So I would say this, exhortation to men, fathers, shoot it straight. And if shooting crooked, ask God for help because he will give it to you. Amen? Amen? Regarding this idea of accountability, there is another part of that. Fathers are to be responsible to provide for their children's needs. Yeah, yeah. Amen. I'm just going to share this verse, and it'll probably convict you like it did me. But if you're walking in righteousness, it won't. Listen to this. 1 Timothy 5.8. If anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for the, uh, those of his own household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. I wrote in my notes, whoa. Whoa. That's pretty heavy. You know the term deadbeat dad. That, that's prevalent. Unfortunately, we just leave our kids and go. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. Maybe you've already blown it. If that's you, you know what? Make recompense. Get right. Provide for your kids the best you can. I can't, man. I don't have a job. You know what? Ask God for a job. Ask God to help you be a man of God. Fear him, and he'll show you the good in the right way. Amen? So, again, it always comes back to our Heavenly Father because he's a good God. He's a good, good God. And so, moving on to the next one, T, F-A-T, teach. Good fathers teach their children. You know the verse. Proverbs 22, verse 6 says this. Train up a child in the way he shall go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. This means we need to be involved in our children's lives. Everything that we say and we do, we're there from the very day that they're born, being involved. It is the responsibility of father, parents, to provide family, social, academic, and spiritual guidance through and through. It's not the school's responsibility. It's not the church's responsibility. It's your responsibility because God gave them to you. Amen? Amen. But it's our responsibility to train them up. And again, if you have a broken arrow, maybe, a kid that's going astray, you're like, Lord, I taught them the word. They know better. But right now, they're way over here, out in left field. Pray more. You pray them back because it says that they will come back. Because what you're doing, what you did and training them up, you did in faith. And that honors God. Ultimately, they got to make their own decision. But you know what? They will come back. I know how that goes. Because when they get older, they think, oh, you know, I'm going to do it my way. And their way is the best way. But at some point, just like I did, 24 years old, I was like, Man, I'm blowing it. <laughs> what my dad was said was right. And then I got born again. Truly. And now I knew why I needed to serve Jesus Christ. Crazy. Let's move on. Point number four, H. Open their hearts. Good fathers open their hearts to their children. Dads should spend time with their kids, making every moment count. The scriptures make it clear that dads must engage their children in deep, Heart-to-heart -heart conversations. Talk to them. <laughs> Why? So that you can impart wisdom to them. That's recorded in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 6 through 9. I'm not going to go there for time's sake, but it says you should teach them. Uh, uh, the word should be in your heart, but you should teach them when you sit down, when you walk, when you rise. Oh, everything that you do. Scriptures all the way to your house, everywhere. Everything that you do should be to glorify the Lord, and that's when you teach the kids. Something as simple as, you know what? At the breakfast table, okay, Jeremiah, uh, what's going on? He goes, oh, I got a test today. Well, did you pray about it? Well, God doesn't care about my test. Oh, yes, he does. You know what? He could sharpen your mind and help you to be just alert. Yeah, but, Dad, I didn't study. No, <laughs> well, you know what? You're on your own. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, it's it. You pray. So let's just pray that God will give you a sharp mind that as you read the questions, you would answer wisely. 
You can help your kids in every scenario, but you have to bring the Lord into it because your heart is to have a conversation with your kid. It's so valuable. Now, we might be short here, I understand, uh, but you know what? Schedule time to hang out with your kids. If you're a kid and you want to honor your father, schedule time to take dad out for a sandwich or, or, or mom out to this, you know? Schedule time. Make time for them. Why do we let our jobs, our businesses rule our lives and we're so tired we can't do anything, you know? What about relationship? It's the most. It pours over into your relationship with God. I'm not going to go to church today. I'm just going to, uh, I can't join that Bible study. Uh, no, it's foolish. Get up and do it. God sees your heart. He sees your heart. So we need to have open hearts for our children. Fifthly, good fathers are to encourage their children. Encouragement is, is so important to a kid when you praise them and you find good in their lives. You find something that say, good job. Amen, that's wonderful. Unfortunately, instead of encouraging, we discourage our children. How sad it is that we can destroy our own kid's life through the power of the tongue. If you say you're an idiot, you're stupid, what do you think your kid's going to believe about themselves? Because you're the representative, the authority in their life, and you're saying that they're stupid? Stupid kid doesn't even know how to get me a beer. Wow. And you wonder why your kids don't bless you. You wonder why they don't hang around you. Some of us need to repent. We want to be a good example but you know what? We leave a bad example. We're supposed to encourage our kid. Check out this warning to fathers in Ephesians 6.4. It's on the screen. And you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and the admonition of the Lord. Your words have the power to make or break your children. One word. Wow. Hopefully they're good words because you're meditating on the word. Sixthly, let's get to the letter R. Good fathers are role models then for their children, right? Role models are so important. Your kids see everything you do. Back in the 90s, I used to say, you know, kids are like a blank tape, a Memorex tape, but that's, that doesn't work anymore. You know, they, they, they record everything. That's what I meant. Well, you know, now kids have cell phones, and they record you this way, and they're like, did you see what dad did? Oh, gosh. Crazy. We're supposed to be role models for our children. Psalm 1-1 says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. Your kids watch when you walk in unrighteousness. They see that your man cave, you know, has a calendar with uh, bikini ladies or whatever. They see all of that. And it makes it easier for them to cross that boundary. Because dad does it. Or mom. But this is dad's day, so I get to pick on you a little bit. Yeah, guys, your kids are watching and they're recording. Kids are looking for godly role models, especially our own kids. But let me just say this for the sake of fathers in the field kids and, and those of you that are here. It is so important that even if you don't have kids, know that there are a lot of kids that don't have dads. And you know, we have this wonderful ministry that we just prayed for, Fathers in the Field, in which a dad says, or, or a man, a godly man says, you know what, I'm going to step up and I'm going to be there for that kid. Oh, that goes so far. Listen to this quote from Danis Rainey. He says, what a boy can use and too often doesn't have are the heart of his father and the fellowship of men. A boy needs at least one man who pays attention to him and spends time with him and admires him. A boy needs a role model, a man whom he can regard as mentors. Amen. If I may salute you guys, thank you for stepping up. That's huge. Step up. So if you've never had kids, you can't have kids, your kids aren't here anymore, you can always become a mentor. Amen? Don't waste the wonderful stuff you have. And our kids are also looking to us. I've heard it said that uh, a father is a daughter's first love and a son's first hero. I love that. I encourage you, men, be a good role model. Finally, number seven, S. Demonstrate 
sacrificial love for children. How important that is. The greatest quality an earthly father learns, learns, it comes from his father's heart, his heavenly father's heart. First John 4, 9 says, in this, the love of God was manifested towards us, shown towards us, demonstrated towards us, that God has sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. Powerful. What do I see there? First off, regarding sacrificial love, it should be patient in dealing with our kids' shortcomings. I've already said that, but 1 Corinthians 13 Four through eight talks about that. Sacrificial love is willing to put our children first. It costs you your time, your money, so many other things. It's going to cost you. But when you do it right, like I said, in the first 20 years, oh, your kids are going to rise up and bless you because they saw that you did it in sacrificial love so that they could go 10,000 miles further than you and tell everybody about Jesus Christ. Sacrificial love, according to this verse, also produces life in our children that they may live. God sent his son, he sacrificed so that we can live. We should do the same for our kids. We sacrifice for our kids so that they can live a good life. And then finally, sacrificial love always pleases God. This brings him glory. So then, as an earthly father, let me close and say Love is the key. Love is the key, my brothers and sisters. That's what a earth, I'm sorry, earthly father, I said heavenly, an earthly father. These are the good attributes of earthly fathers. I do have one more bonus attribute. Do you mind if I share with you real quick? I think it's absolutely vital. I'm going to share it anyways. <laughs> if I can add but one more letter to the acronym fathers, it would be the letter P. P, you might say. That doesn't go with fathers. But when it's placed in front of the word fathers, its pronunciation would not be changed. Try to say fathers with a P. Fathers. Right? It's not fathers. It's fathers. The P is silent. And that is what we should do as men. We should be praying fathers. Fathers that pray. Praying fathers are good fathers. Fathers should be men that pray night and day as Job did for his children that the Lord would protect them from evil or from mistakes. We should earnestly depend upon our Heavenly Father for direction and guidance for your children. Fathers in this room, how are you doing in this area of prayer? It is the most essential thing because it develops your love. It makes you mindful of training and fear and all these other things. If you're not praying, you're probably straying. And you're only concerned with your own ways. I pray that God would convict us of that this morning. That we would turn to him and say, Lord, I need to pray. Forgive me for my prayerlessness. Ask your heavenly father to help you to be a good father. And draw your strength from him. So these are the attributes of a good father. Our heavenly father and our earthly fathers. I'm going to ask the worship team to come up right now. We're going to close, but I have a few more exhortations because there's so many different people here in this room. I want to make sure that I address everybody over there, Creekside, online, all of us in this room, upstairs. Listen to this. On Father's Day 2019, if we are in the category of men with children that are still around, then I'm going to encourage you, exhort you, be godly. Be kind to your children. Be loving. Be there. Be awesome. They need a dad that's awesome. If you're a man without children, then I'm going to ask you to do this. Be a role model. Become a mentor. That's awesome. If you're in the category, well, we're all in this category, we're all children with earthly fathers because we're here, right? Remember your earthly father and honor them. That's awesome. And then lastly, we're all children of our heavenly father. I encourage you today and the rest of your life to glorify him in all that you say and do. Honor him in your life. Why? Because he's awesome. 
Amen. Let's bow our heads and pray. Father God.